it's now my privilege to move to our second part this afternoon uh, on the criminal justice system in this seminar, Black Lives Matter, a roadmap for policing and reform in justice, supported by the Redfern Legal Centre, the National Justice Project and the Jumbana Institute. Our second panel this afternoon consists of Carly Warner, the CEO of the Aboriginal Legal Service New South Wales and ACT. Thalia Anthony, who's from the Law Faculty at UTS in Sydney, and George Newhouse, who's the National Justice Project Head, the CEO, I guess, equivalent, and um, also uh, oversees uh, Copwatch. So um, thank you, uh, the three of you, for being with us. Carly, I thought I'd start with you and um, I guess a big picture question, really, but as a result of the increased attention to the issues facing First Nations people and the criminal justice system as a result of the Black Lives Matter movement, what do you, from your perspective, think are the most important things for Australia to know about that relationship between First Nations people and the criminal justice system? Thanks, Larissa. Uh, I want to acknowledge country. I'm on Gadigal land and pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, sovereignty never ceded and always was and always will be Aboriginal land. For me, the, the starting point, um, you know, whatever our race, our background or our postcode, we all want to move through our communities without fearing for our lives or our loved ones. I think the Black Lives Matter movement has brought renewed focus to racial injustice issues in the past few months. And we don't need to look to America to see the consequences of systemic discrimination. We absolutely see it here. And what I wanna to emphasize today and perhaps to be a takeaway is that, um, and, and following really from the comments from Chris Kinnean and, and Lyndon Coombs in the previous session that, uh, this is how the system has been designed um, and pose a reflective question of actually what kind of society do we want to belong to? Uh, following invasion and the continued dispossession, you know, new laws were imposed um, that were used to rule over our communities. We had no say in those laws that were created and, and the police and the courts have historically played a fundamental role in the oppression of our communities. And it's important to remember this history and legacy when we think about the relationship between our communities and the legal system today. It's so incredibly heartening to see that people of good conscience right around this country and the world are demanding that we respect and honour black lives. But I really want people to do some of their own research and, and consider whether tinkering around the edges of this system has had a meaningful impact and whether it will have a meaningful impact. Um, you know, that tinkering has led to massive capital investment in expanding prisons and jails and more privatised prisons. Um, sentencing laws have been through radical changes, including implementation of mandatory sentences, mandatory minimums, recidivist offender laws like three strikes, and in addition, the criminal law has been expanded, dramatically increasing the number of behaviours for which there is criminal liability, in turn widening the net of the justice system and the role of police, as we've just heard um, in the last discussion. And so I guess for me, the result of tinkering is seeing our kids, our mums, our dads subjected to the disparate treatment at every stage of the justice system and there's just story after story from unlawful strip searches of a 16 year old Aboriginal boy in the street of a New South Wales regional town, the horrific treatment of a young person by police officer in Surrey Hills um, and we had a young uh, person who was forced to move towns after police harassment got so bad. He was placed on the state's uh, suspect target management plan and for no other reason that his dad had been previously incarcerated, you know, he was targeted. So this, this is the tinkering um, that we're seeing. Um, and this, you know, these stories aren't one-offs. This is just the tip of the iceberg. And of course, um, 
you know, at the, at the other end of the scale, we've got so many families grieving. And I really just want to acknowledge the work um, that all of these families have been doing for so long and the load that they have carried in campaigning for change all while they're grieving. Thank you. I want to um, pull up just, uh, I guess, um, the idea that there are other ways forward uh, the not tinkering around the edges idea that you had and ask Thalia, um, and this question's come up a bit in the in the questions uh, from the audience as well, but um, of course the best way to prevent overrepresentation in the pr in prisons is not to send people there in the first place. From your perspective, Thalia, what are the sorts of alternatives we should be looking at? You're on mute. Thanks, Larissa. Um, also like to acknowledge uh, Wongul people of the Eora Nation, always was, always will be Wongul land. Um, I think the foregrounding principle when we look at alternatives is that any alternatives need to be designed, owned and run by First Nations communities and organisations. Um, Carly is um, absolutely right in talking about tinkering and this is no different when we look at alternatives. So the state's quite good at introducing alternatives. Um, for instance, after the Royal Commission into um, youth detention in the Northern Territory, um, the, one of the recommendations was to have bail accommodation as an alternative to youth detention. So what did the Northern Territory government do? They set up a facility across the road from Dondale and called it bail accommodation, but it was just prison in another name. Um, and it's the same with New South Wales, for instance. Um, they've set out all these community and intensive corrections orders that have harsh conditions and set people up to fail. Um, and so ultimately bring more people into prison widen the net. Um, and, and so the alternatives need to be things that are going on, um, such as successful programs run by Aboriginal women, like Mudjingal in inner city Sydney, like Waminda on the south coast of, of New South Wales, where um, Aboriginal women are providing a holistic approach to um, an alternative to prison. So they're looking at things like strengths-based programs, healing supports, um, setting up safe housing, getting the women um, jobs, and very importantly, support for family restoration and strengths. Um, so it's providing that overall approach to social, cultural, and emotional well-being that is needed. Um, and I think that's that's the um, way to keep mob out of, out of prison. It's it's to actually look at things outside of the criminal justice system rather than just the justice system trying to um, undertake the impossible task of fi fixing itself. Thanks, Salia. George, I want to bring you in now and and. Um, I guess dig down into uh, one of the issues that seems to be intractable in that, um, you know, we've, with, despite the Royal Commission, we still really average about one death in custody a month. And you, you have done a lot of work on coronial inquests into deaths in custody. And I was wondering if you could pull out for us from that work that you're doing, what some of the recurring themes are, what are the things that are still in the system failing that means that we're still seeing those statistics that obviously have a, have a huge human impact? Well, thank you, Larissa. Um, a death in custody is the ultimate systemic failure. Um, individuals only end up in custody because of failures in other systems like social services, education, child safety, policing, the criminal justice system. And, and quite frankly, the coronial inquest is the final indignity for many uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families. Uh, they come into the system seeking truth, accountability, and some comfort. And often they're let down by that system that doesn't represent uh, or re respect 
culture and in many cases can re-traumatize families where colonial definitions of justice don't match family or community expectations. And the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody prioritised inquests as a mechanism to ensure that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander deaths are properly investigated and recommendations are made to ensure that deaths aren't repeated. But unfortunately, uh, many coroners, and um, I've said this before, Larissa, with you, not all of them, but many, <laughs> continue to let um, Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander people down on a consistent basis. Um, I, and, and just in that regard, I think one, a major reform that we need to see is uh, the appointment of Indigenous coroners to oversight Indigenous deaths. And then you might see um, a better outcome from that process. But there's, a, you know, a, just to come back to answer your question, um, a death in custody is usually uh, the, the combination of uh, failures in all of uh, government services from social education, the Department of Child Safety, policing, the criminal justice system. And at the moment, I don't think that the coronial system is actually assisting either. Thanks, George. Um, Carly, I thought I'd come back to you. Um, there's obviously been a lot of discussion about the um, the role the federal government can play in these issues. Law and justice issues are ostensibly state issues, but there has been talk about national justice targets and a, a lot of advocacy for them. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a bit about why they're necessary and how they'd help, what they should look like, and any reflections you've had on the government's recent announcements about them. Almost 30 years ago, um, the Royal Commission set out the roadmap for change. And, and yet Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people continue to die in custody and be locked up at alarming rates. And this is, this is not new for us. Um, I, I think it's something that we as um, peoples are very used to is this federalism argument and this handballing of whose responsibility everything is. It's my view that if national justice targets were in place, then we'd be able to demand the annual reporting and, and the accountability. The Commonwealth would not be able to escape responsibility for a lack of progress and a lack of leadership. Um, I think justice targets are critical. Um, I think they provide an important vehicle to drive accountability and resourcing to meet those goals, but they must be meaningful. Um, and as I said before, you know, if we're, going to, if we're going to have justice targets that are based on the current ways that a justice system operates, then we, we're not reimagining how we're going to actually reduce that over-incarceration. It, it absolutely involves people um, turning everything on its head. Um, and, I, and I think that idea has been perhaps a bit confronting for some, but uh, I also think that's um, power. And I think as previous speakers have mentioned, and people don't want to give up that power. Um, you know, the overwhelming response from community to the draft targets that have been reported in the media over the past few weeks is that they want to see stronger, more ambitious targets that would end over incarceration urgently, rather than a completely unacceptable proposal of 2093. Throughout the Closing the Gap Refresh process, our position has been that governments can end the over incarceration of our people. Um, you know, Natsals has been asking for parity within 10 years or an 80%, which would get parity in 15 years for adults and 19 years for kids. Um, I think for me, you know, who of us are gonna be around in 2093 to hold people to account? Um, the solutions from countless inquiries and royal commissions are really clear. And now we need to see strong political commitments with sufficient resources to flip business as usual on its head. And I hope that when National Cabinet meets, we will see that ambitious justice targets 
are adopted uh, because anything less is unacceptable. Thank you. Um, Thalia, I want to turn to you now. You um, do a lot of work in the space, um, advocacy research, but you do also teach within a law school. And um, obviously that's where we're training the profession, whether they become judges or lawyers, and they're all part of these, this system. I was wondering from your perspective, um, what would you like to see in terms of what legal education and judicial education focuses on? And could that be a way to make a difference? Yeah, a, a great question. I think it could be. Um, I would say the first um, position is to diversify the cohort that's admitted to law schools, to the legal profession um, and to the ju judiciary. Um, there's a tendency for law schools to be breeding grounds for white graduates from private schools that have rarely seen, um, you know, disadvantage or marginalisation. Um, so there needs to be much better access for, for First Nations um, students and people. Um, and that flows on then to the profession and the judiciary. And then within our law schools and continuing legal education, there needs to be mandatory education on systemic racism, um, including deaths in custody, police violence, colonisation, but not a, to be taught as a historical artefact, but as a living experience um, that occurs within the parameters of our legal system. Um, and we need to teach that the judiciary is not only a check on political authority, but it's embedded in hierarchies that are invested in racism. Um, so once we are able to accept these truths within the law schools, we can start to change thinking among our students and the, and the legal profession. I also think, and this um, it dovetails with something Chris was saying earlier, that um, law students and law academics need to be activists. And Jambana's been, um, you know, trailblazers in showing us what this looks like. So law schools should be running law clinics and outreach programs that respond to the priorities of First Nations communities. Um, they should be doing things to protect the rights of people in prison. They should be running strategic cases and providing advice. They should be doing things like clinics that provide um, advice on legal rights to First Nations kids. Um, so they know what to do when the, the police confront them. Um, and similarly, the judiciary should be visiting the prisons where they're sending so many people to, to understand what it looks like. I've interviewed many judges and, and many of them have said that they've never seen inside a prison. Um, so I think they need to do a lot of work building relationships and being accountable. Um, and this should be part of a rite of passage for, for a judge and, and for a law professional. Great, thanks Thalia. George, um, I wonder if you could tell us about Copwatch, um, which is a really important this community focused strategy and the kind of changes that it can facilitate. Yeah, look, Copwatch is an educational program designed to train um, Indigenous children about how to safely film their interactions with police. It's not just about how you video and record but how you do it safely and to de-escalate situations. It's also about training the differences between filming for evidence versus filming for advocacy, because they um, can be used in multiple applications. And most importantly, when to upload. Um, young people tend to upload everything immediately and there can be real value in going and seeking advice from an elder or a legal service before uploading. But Copwatch has been incredibly powerful. I think it's changing attitudes to policing and in many ways has led to the interest in the Black Lives Matter movement because video evidence has been so powerful, both in court and for advocacy. Black Lives Matter probably wouldn't have had the same impact today without video, you wouldn't be able to compare the death of George Floyd, the horrific death of George Floyd with the horrific death of David Dungay without video evidence. And quite on, you know, quite frankly, um, it's unlikely that the narrative would be told truthfully without 
that video evidence. And Copwatch has been successful in having a police officer charged in Perth with running down uh, a, a Noongar man. Uh, it's, we've had charges against young people dismissed as a result of film evidence that was captured on video. And in recent times, it's been used to highlight police misconduct where a 16 year old Aboriginal boy was taken down by New South Wales police in Surrey Hills. And I know that Carly's been working very closely with the family in that matter. Um, so I think uh, programs like Copwatch and filming the police and authorities when they're abusing their power has been critical to change. Thanks, George. Um, Carly, the first recommendation of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody was about self-determination. Um, and I was wondering what role the Aboriginal community controlled sector should be playing in the justice space from your perspective and how can our legal services be better supported? It was interesting, there were a couple of questions coming through in the last panel asking about how the ALSs can be better supported. Thanks, Larissa. Um, the ALS opened its doors in, in 1970 uh, in Redfern as, as not just the first Aboriginal legal service in this country, but the first free legal assistance service. Um, we're turning 50 this year. And I want to acknowledge um, those activists, you know, it was founded as a response to injustice, um, a recognition of the failure of of mainstream services to meet the, the structural, the cultural and the service needs of Aboriginal people. And Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people wanted a different model, um, community control. And it's that community control that sets Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander legal services like the ALS apart. Um, community voices, cultural connections and, and a deep understanding of the way that the justice system impacts Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities is embedded in the way that we work. Um, and that community control model is obviously driven by the self-determination, the knowledge that um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people know what our communities need to thrive. And, and just following on um, and acknowledging the great work that Copwatch has done um, from George, I think we have to acknowledge that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, you know, that wouldn't have been so successful if Aboriginal people weren't um, considering their kind of cultural uh, obligations and protocols to allow this footage to be used. Um, and, and I think that's been a huge um, thing and, and we really need to acknowledge communities for like letting that, that happen because um, of course, to show some of that footage, um, to mention people's names, you know, is really difficult. Um, so I think it's, it's a reflection really for, for me that you know, ATSLs and, and communities aren't, you know, distinct. They're not mutually exclusive. Um, I do want to acknowledge that the, the ALS, like many legal services, is um, forced really to make really difficult decisions about where our services go. Um, and of course, you know, we're dealing with things at the moment where I'm going to get 12 months of funding right now um, to do something. And I know at the end of that 12 months that that money is going to go. And I'm going to have to explain to community that that service is going to need to go. Um, and this is the stuff that happens constantly, that we are on these sort of shoestring budgets that um, are not sort of adding to the baseline to continue to deliver the services the community need. And we're absolutely constrained. Um, it is just completely um, horrific that we have got uh, two family law lawyers in the ALS for the whole of New South Wales and the ACT. Um, 11 care and protection solicitors trying to service 26 courts across New South Wales. And I completely understand when um, people are kind of asking questions about, well, why not this court and why not this court and why not this community? Um, because I too ask those questions. 
Um, but there's something that I think really needs to happen for us in ALS New South Wales ACT, and that is that we need support to develop a general civil law practice at the ALS. Um, and of course, increasing sort of the resources and support that we can provide to community in care and protection and in family law and in a criminal law context and not mutually exclusive. Um, and we don't have a civil law service at the moment due to trying to make those difficult decisions around where we put that funding. Um, but one of the big arguments that I have very regularly at the moment is why a community controlled legal service delivering general civil law services is distinct from anyone or any other service who delivers civil law services um, and of the need for the ALS in a self-determination sense to be able to support our communities with the issues that they bring to us. You know, it's just yesterday that I was having conversation with someone and saying I'm sorry we don't we don't do that work and of course then it's well why and 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 why are you you know why are you helping people in this area and why won't you help me kind of with this particular problem um, and so I think it's really critical for people to be standing up and supporting ALS New South Wales ACT to develop a standalone civil law practice. Thank you well that's something we can all get behind Thalia, I asked you earlier about alternatives to imprisonment, but another area that you've done a lot of work in is assisting women, particularly with the transition out. And I wondered if you could talk a bit about what you've observed there and what needs to be done so that we can do better in that space to ensure that people aren't caught up in the system continuously. Yeah, um, I think um, a lot of this knowledge um, importantly comes from um, the Koori women who are affected by this system because they know the solutions, they are the solution. Um, and I think um, it's like what Carly was saying, it's providing those supports around them to enact them. And for many of the women, the supports they need do relate more to the civil system than to the criminal system. Um, so last year with, um, Wiradjuri woman and researcher Gemma Sentance and Darug researcher Michelle Toy, I yarned with over 160 Aboriginal women in six New South Wales prisons, which on reflection was very fortunate because we know now prisons have been closed down um, due to COVID and um, the women and men inside um, are suffering terribly because of that. Um, as well as the increasing risk we're seeing in Victoria to their lives from COVID. Fortunately, we had many opportunities to sit down with these women over 13 visits and we talked to them about how they were feeling about sentencing, um, their views on the prison sentence and what alternatives there, there could be. And um, unsurprisingly, they said that sentencing made them feel really upset and depressed some of them said they felt suicidal because they were so excluded from the process. Um, they said the sentence of imprisonment was excessively harsh, not only for themselves, but for their children who are the invisible victims of a sentence. Um, and, and they talked about the harms to their families. Um, but more than sentencing, what they really wanted to talk to us about in these yarning circles was life outside of prison, especially for their children. Um, they wanted to talk about, you know, restoring their relationships with their children when they were released from prison and the need for any transition to include their families. So if they were to go to rehabilitation, to make it a facility for Aboriginal women where they could have their children with them. And there are no facilities like that just for Aboriginal women in New South Wales. Um, they wanted safe and stable housing. Um, they wanted their welfare um, and, and um, the ability to pay off debts and provide for their kids. And they wanted to reconnect and give back to their communities. Um, and I think what was really apparent in our discussions with the Koori women was that fundamentally they're carers. Um, almost 
all of them were were mothers and grandmothers and and all of them would have been aunties sisters cousins and they wanted to go out into the community and look after their kids help with their schooling take on jobs in aged care set up businesses to care for the pets of other people in prison who couldn't be cared for they wanted to set up cooking programs on the mish they wanted to do all these things that involved giving back and I think if we can harness these roles um, among First Nations women and mothers and grandmothers, rather than locking them up, our whole communities would be stronger because of it. Thank you, Thali. I just always love when you ask those questions to mob on the ground. They have the most practical, simple answers to intractable issues. Um, George, I, I wanted to turn to you next. I think one of the interesting areas where you work in is really that intersection between, I guess, deaths in custody issues, but also the discrimination between with the provision of health was obviously an issue that was looked at during the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody. And I think in some ways your work in this inter intersecting space shows how far we've got to come. So I was wondering if you could talk a bit about that work and the kind of cases you see where um, the failures in both systems inter inter interconnect with devastating impact on First Nations yeah. people. Yes, and uh, as you point out, a lot of the focus of the Black Lives Matter movement has been on policing and incarceration. But uh, as you just pointed out, the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody did make the observation about the intersection between uh, healthcare and Indigenous deaths. And, you know, the average person presumes that prejudice doesn't exist in a helping service like healthcare. But the problem is that prejudice is insidious. And you may recall uh, that the late Dr. Unipingu um, was left for seven hours on a stretcher in um, Darwin, Royal Darwin Hospital, because uh, clinicians thought that he was drunk. He hadn't been drinking at all. Everyone knows that he had a kidney, a serious kidney disease, and that was the cause of his um, his state. But stereotypes uh, are assumed by non-Indigenous doctors and nurses and midwives. And that led to Dr. Unipingu uh, not receiving appropriate care. The same happened with Miss Du. She was stereotyped as a drug user and, the, and her legitimate uh, and very serious uh, claims for uh, healthcare were ignored and she was accused of being a faker until she passed away in custody. Naomi Williams, a 26 year old Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander woman from uh, the Tumut region was uh, presented 15 times, uh, many of which was during a pregnancy to Tumut Hospital. Each time she claimed she was being stereotyped as a drug user. Her serious illness was ignored and she ultimately died after she was turned away from the hospital on the last occasion with septicemia. We, we see cases of stroke victims who are assumed to be alcoholics. And, and these prejudice, prejudices play out in shocking ways. David Dungay was actually, uh, actually being held in a prison hospital. New South Wales is the only state in Australia that has this strange uh, confection of prison and healthcare. And it was that intersection that led to David's death. Um, one of the good things about the New South Wales Deputy uh, State Coroner was she, uh, she saw um, racial bias as contributing to Naomi's death. She made a number of very powerful recommendations about employment targets and auditing for bias and racism and identifying tools that could be used to overcome the systemic bias in the system. And the Williams family has uh, pushed the health minister in New South Wales to accept all of those uh, recommendations and hopefully we'll start to see uh, the health system addressing that issue. 
Thank you. Um, mindful of the time, and I do want to get in a couple of the audience questions. My final question is to each of you. So I might just do a quick whip around just to hear from you what you think um, our key areas of reform should be in your just from your own personal perspective, what, what are a couple of priorities that you'd like to see come to the forefront? And I might start uh, with you, George. Um, look, I'll just pick up Chris Canine's comments earlier on decolonizing the institutes of the state. I agree with Carly about measuring what we want to change, holding governments accountable for not achieving those targets and fund and support community orgs like the ALS and the Peaks. I won't go on, I'm sure others have many more uh, suggestions. Yes, I, I know we've all got a whole raft of them, so I was a bit cheeky in asking you to just pick a few. What about you, Thalia? Okay, I might give you a bit of a laundry list as well, quickly. Um, look, low hanging fruit, I really believe that we need to stem the tide of bail reform, which has contributed to rising remand rates. Um, over 30% of Aboriginal people in prisons are there on remand, not proven guilty, not sentenced. Um, and then over 50% of Aboriginal kids on remand. I think it's a quick fix. I think with COVID, we've seen that where there's a will to reduce remand, there's a way. And certainly the courts have been much more open to granting bail. There also needs to be reform in sentencing. Um, we need to do away with this risk and punitive mentality towards Aboriginal people and introduce um, more information that gives justice and light to Aboriginal people's holistic lives and experiences. We're seeing this with the ALS in New South Wales and its Bugmere reports. We're seeing this with the Victorian ALS and its Aboriginal community justice reports. So they're trying to provide a narrative based report to humanize Aboriginal people in the courts, to place a check on racism in the courts and to promote non-custodial sentences. And just to finish off, I really do believe that we need to shift the focus from prisons to self-determination, to looking at Aboriginal-led safety, health, justice programs, initiatives such as Aboriginal women's shelters and centres, support for children, night patrols, restorative justice, and essentially um, making sure that um, the prison and police system are kept accountable, not only for deaths in custody, but for every single interaction with a First Nations person. Thanks, Thalia. And Carly, I know you would have a very long laundry list, but what, what would be at the top of it? What are some of your top priorities? Try and be as quick as I can, <laughs> That's Larissa. Right. Um, look, time-wise, I am so deeply concerned right now that COVID has entered prisons in Victoria and uh, New South Wales and the ACT need to act immediately to get people out before it is too late. Um, we also are seeing the Council of Attorneys General meeting on Monday in relation to raising uh, the age and this has to be a huge priority um, so that we stop locking up 10 year olds in barbed wire facilities, strip searching them and giving them limited access to peers, teachers, supports. Um, and I also just wanted to perhaps end with saying there, I know we've sort of focused largely on a criminal law context today, but in terms of um, child protection, we need to introduce legislative amendments to incorporate active efforts um, to require um, the authorities to undertake early intervention casework with the family prior to removing a child. Um, and I just want to make sure that we have mandatory use of early intervention legal tools that promote Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children remaining with their families and within their communities. Thank you so much. Well, um, that's a great place to start though. Obviously just a and the, ice, the, the tip of the iceberg of a larger um, reform agenda. If I can just go to a couple of questions now, and I have to ask this one. Tracy is a 60 year old First Nations lawyer. And when she finishes her law degree at the University of Newcastle, um, she's asking what would be, what would I be best suited to make the most impact for change? What area would I be best suited for to make the most impact for change. So good on you, Tracy. 
um, that's already inspiring just getting out there and showing everyone what you can do. Um, so I don't know, maybe I'll start with you, Carly, and then go to you, Thalia, for advice to Tracy. Thank you. Um, Tracy, I'm not sure I'm the best person to give you advice um, considering at law school, the one area I didn't want to practice in was criminal law and I became a criminal defence lawyer. And so my advice to you would be to try anything and everything and don't um, rule it out for whatever reason, even if that's people tell you, you must come out of university and you must, you know, go on this particular path. It's all crap, really. You find your own path and you find what it is that you like. Um, and I'm sure that you will be great at it. Thalia? Um, what I would say, Tracy, without trying to deter you, is that <laughs> it's really hard work um, working within the legal system and probably the other panellists and Larissa are much more um, qualified to say this, but I um, only spent a very short time. I remember going down um, in Bajura in Glebe, which was a um, children's court and seeing a child behind um, a plastic a glass sheet. And that I think that was pretty much it for me. So I think just find something that you're passionate about um, and and try and do it, I guess, in a way that, you know, is, is, is true to your values, but is going to give you longevity. Um, pace yourself, don't feel like you have to do anything. Um, you know, start, you know, it might be a local ALS or, or it, it might be a community law centre. It might even be a, a private practice, but start somewhere where you feel you can contribute in a small way. And at the end of the day, we are lawyers in our work, but our whole lives are a, a broader contribution and don't feel like you have to do everything in your job. I'm, I'm sure wherever Tracy goes, she'll make an impact. I'm just going to try and squeeze one quest, more question in, and it's for, I'll direct it to you, George. And it's from Shelley Murphy Oates, and I'm not sure it has an answer, but it is a really good question. We've heard a lot about practical solutions, evidence-based um, outcomes, evidence-based research. Why isn't there more? Uh, why isn't there more um, political sway around this? Why aren't governments implementing these solutions? Any thoughts, George? I, I think that's a really good question. Good question. And, no, no. Uh, and I, I think that the government intentionally does not measure uh, bias and racism in the system. So we're not measuring the right things. If you look at um, the closing the gap measures, they often blame, uh, and I use quotes, the victim. You know, they measure things like school attendance and, um, you know, smoking rates, but they don't measure the impact of, racism and prejudice and colonialism on adverse outcomes. So um, I think that there is a political argument about what we're measuring, what evidence-based um, uh, facts we're looking at not, and, and policies we're looking at. And I think the critical issue is to have indigenous organizations and peaks and, and people involved in the programs and, and looking at what we're measuring, because what you're seeing now is a colonial system measuring itself and turning the focus away from its miserable conduct. And I think until we start involving indigenous orgs and indigenous people in the decision-making process, the policy-making process and the measures, you're not gonna see change. That was a great short answer to a complex question, Sorry. George. No, no, it was excellent. <laughs> I threw that at you at the last minute. So I want you all to imagine thunderous applause as we thank Carly Warner, the CEO of the Aboriginal Legal Service New South Wales ACT, Thalia Anthony, Professor at the Law Faculty at UTS Sydney, and George Newhouse, who heads the National Justice Project and Copwatch. Thank you to Redfern Legal Centre and the National Justice Project and the Jambana Institute for supporting today's event. And thank you everyone for taking the time to listen to these great voices and these great issues. And I hope it motivates you to keep on going to make sure there's change. Thank you. Thanks everyone. I guess we just go. <laughs>
I think we do. Yeah. It was a bit anticlimactic. <laughs> I know it's not the same when there's no applause, is it? have a virtual drink. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm with you, Thalia. But I guess we're just both, we're just all going to go straight back to work. Uh, I think we get Hi, Thalia. Hey, everyone. We're still in. Um, yeah. We're just waiting for all attendees to leave. Thank you. But thanks to you guys, you were great. What a pleasure to interview you all, albeit quickly. Um, yeah, it was really great to hear from you, Carly. Yeah, it was. It's fantastic. Thank you. And Larissa, you must be exhausted. <laughs> well, I had that <laughs> panic about <laughs> I had the adrenaline rush of thinking, oh my God, I'm not gonna make it. So yeah, I think I'll I'll have a nice relax tonight. Yeah. Actually, I'm, I'm actually going out to dinner with Sonia Stewart, COVID friendly, to celebrate her appointment as the first female and Indigenous person to head the New South Wales Law Society. So, oh, good that is a great milestone. She was just appointed, it's just been made public. And, you know, Indigenous women getting out there, getting these jobs, making change one step at a time. But I think 